Is there a possibility we have the face of a serial killer on our $100 bill? I'm Sarah, and this is Conspiracy Central. Benjamin Franklin, Capricorn King, was born on January 17, 1706, to candlestick maker Josiah Franklin and Abiah Folger in Massachusetts. Now, Benjamin wasn't an only child. In fact, he had 16 other siblings. Josiah had been married twice and clearly was very busy in each marriage and Benjamin was Josiah's 10th and final son. Josiah was set on Benjamin having a career in the church, but the family didn't have a lot of funds to split among all of the children. Paying to go to school with the clergy wasn't an easy financial decision. Josiah had enough money to send Benjamin to school for two years, but that was it. When he turned 10 years old, he stopped attending school altogether. At 12, Ben started working in a printing press alongside his brother, James. James would go on to found one of the first newspapers in the United States, the New England Current. Benjamin was a very intelligent kid and read all of the time. Being witty at a young age made it easy for him to play little tricks and outsmart people. At one point during his printing apprenticeship, he played as his very own Lady Whistledown for any of my Bridgerton fans out there. Benjamin wanted to put his own thoughts into the paper, but was denied. So he wrote under the name Silence Do Good, a middle-aged widow, and that letter was published all under his brother's nose. Apparently, the paper became a hit around town and people couldn't get enough of good old silence and do good. But under this fake name, he spoke out against injustices and government and is quoted in the paper saying, without freedom of thought, there could be no such thing as wisdom and no such thing as public liberty without freedom of speech. At 17, Benjamin left his home and traveled to Philadelphia. It was there that his life truly started to look up and take off. In 1726, Benjamin opened his own printing shop. He would often write for other publications under false names, hiding his identity in case he ruffled too many feathers. But his career really took off with the publication of Poor Richard's Almanac, which he released for over 20 years. He became known for his witty sayings such as, Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. And he was determined to become a useful member of society and wanted to take charge. He knew that the community needed more resources. During this time in history, books were not easy to get and weren't available to the public in the way that they are now. And in 1731, he established a lending library, making access to books way easier. On top of that, he started Philadelphia's first fire company, Police Patrol, raised funds to build a hospital for the city, and helped pave and light the streets. A few years later, he was appointed as Postmaster General for Philadelphia. In 1753, he became Postmaster General for all of the colonies. What? That's crazy. Britain appointed him to the role, but eventually he was taken out of the position because he was too sympathetic towards colonists. And obviously Britain was like, stop that. Don't do that. Why do you like the colonies so much? During this time, he was becoming known for his scientific experiments. He invented the lightning rod, which was crucial in protecting homes and businesses from fires. We all know about the famous kite in the key experiment, discovering electricity from the lightning, and he even came up with the words battery, charge, and conductor. Ben was all over the place, discovering this, raising money for that, printing this, discovering what causes the common cold. I mean, this guy had his fingers in multiple pies, and the people trusted him. While Ben spent time in London during the crucial periods before the Revolutionary War and during its start, he eventually made his way back to Philadelphia, where he served in the Second Continental Congress right after the war started. He helped draft the Declaration of Independence and traveled to France to get their allyship in the war, which provided funds that were crucial to the United States winning and getting a leg up on their enemies. And in 1783, he drafted and negotiated the Treaty of Paris for the US, which ultimately ended the Revolutionary War. Okay, so Benjamin Franklin, really smart, invented a lot, helped win wars, but he can't be all great, can he? There's gotta be something off about the guy. Well, what if I told you, while the man was starting libraries and putting keys on kites, he was secretly killing people and burying the bodies in his yard? Benjamin lived at 36 Craven Street in London, where he stayed for almost two decades just before the Revolutionary War. In 1998, his home was under renovations. Why? Well, because it was going to become a museum dedicated to Benjamin, his accomplishments, his life, etc. Well, during the repairs, workers found something terrifying. A massive pit, three feet deep and three feet wide, buried inside hundreds of bones. More than a dozen bodies were found thrown into the pit, and at least six of those were children. Huh? Hundreds of bones. Bodies. Okay. Well, maybe the bodies weren't there because of Benjamin. 
They could have been buried there at any point in time, right? Well, when the bones were discovered, obviously a few phone calls were made. Historians, forensic scientists, all of the above. Testing was done on the ground, the bones, and it was discovered that the bodies dated back to Ben Franklin's time and were buried in the area that would have been his basement. But that doesn't make any sense. Why the hell would Benjamin Franklin have a bunch of bodies buried in the basement? Did he have a secret life that he was living in London? Was he actually some Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde monster, building hospitals during the day and killing people and burying their bodies at night? So there seems to be a fairly reasonable explanation to the discovery of these hundred plus bones underground in his London home. Benjamin had a friend and protege by the name of William Hewson. Hewson was a doctor that also taught at the local university. There, he and his students would dissect bodies and learn about human anatomy, which they still had so much to discover. When Hewson and the university had some differences about their practices, Hewson decided to open up a secret, tiny anatomy school in Benjamin Franklin's basement. Apparently, at the time, grave robberies and body snatching were a massive problem. People would dig up bodies and sell them to universities to study and dissect. It wasn't the best job, but poor people found a new way to make some form of income, even if it was a little scary and smelly. So families would often dig up their own loved ones to stop the bodies from being snatched. It was a popular belief that only a fully intact body would even be granted access to heaven, which made the whole dissection thing even scarier. A steady supply of human bodies was hard to come by legally, so Hewson, Hunter, and the field's other pioneers had to turn to grave robbing, either paying professional resurrection men to procure cadavers or digging them up themselves to get their hands on specimens. Researchers think that 36 Craven was an irresistible spot for Hewson to establish his own anatomy lab. The tenant was a trusted friend, the landlady was his mother-in-law, and he was flanked by convenient sources for corpses. Bodies could be smuggled from graveyards and delivered to the wharf at one end of the street or snatched from the gallows at the other end. When he was done with them, Houston simply buried whatever was left of the bodies in the basement, rather than sneak them out for disposal elsewhere and risk getting caught and prosecuted for dissection and grave robbing. At the time, many people believed that only a university could dissect bodies, which made Hewson's little anatomy school super illegal, even if it was in the name of science. Since there was all this competition for universities to get the freshest bodies, super old and decayed bodies were harder to work on, Benjamin started paying people to bring the bodies to his back door for his friend to cut open. What isn't fully known is if these were dead bodies from people who had passed from natural causes, or if these grave robbers were actually going out killing random people and bringing the freshly dead corpses to Benjamin Franklin and William Hewson's underground anatomy school for, you know, a couple of bucks. I guess we'll never know the exact reason these people died. Sure, it could be from a multitude of diseases at the time, but they could have been murdered. That's still up for debate. A popular rumor at the time, since embalming bodies wasn't really a thing in the colonies, was that people were being buried alive. The grave diggers stated that some coffins were found with scratch marks on the wood, meaning people were trying to scratch and fight their way out of the ground. Because of this, loved ones would tie a string to the dead body. It would travel up through a small hole in the coffin to a stick outside of the coffin above the ground with a bell attached. If the person was accidentally still alive, they could just wiggle their finger and then the bell would ring. And there was a real job at the time where someone would sit up all night waiting to hear a ringing bell. If they did, and occasionally they did, their job was to dig up the dirt and rescue the actually alive person from inside the coffin. This is where we get the term graveyard shift. This also helped fuel rumors of vampires because some bells wouldn't ring until the sun went down and the moon was out. I love that. William Hewson died fairly young from an infection he received while working on a dead body in Franklin's basement. He's known as the father of hematology because of his extensive work on bodies, human blood, blood diseases, and blood-related organs. He created some of the first in-depth visuals of human organs that we have, and all from the comfort of his good pal, Benjamin Franklin's house. How nice. And that, my lovely friends, is all that I have for you today. Have any of you heard this story before? I never knew he had bodies in the basement, even if he wasn't the one going out and getting the bodies. Or maybe he was... Nah, I don't believe it. I'll see you guys in the next one. I'm Sarah, and this is Conspiracy Central.